On this month's edition of the FIFA World Cup magazine, we profile Road to Volgograd's head coach, Valery Yesipov. We track the progress of the 2018 Stadia on the news agency's tour. And we remember a historic match with Dinamo St. Petersburg. We begin, though, in Moscow and the launch of the FIFA World Cup Trophy Tour. Beginning at the Luzhniki Stadium, where the captain of the newly crowned world champions will lift the trophy in just over nine months' time, the tour is the longest in history. It will cover 26,000 kilometres, visiting 24 cities within Russia itself, whilst also visiting 50 countries worldwide. As part of the day's festivities, children from various schools and academies across the city took part in a mini competition on the stadium's pitch and had the opportunity to rub shoulders with a number of former players, including France and Brazil's World Cup winners David Trezeguet and Bebeto. It's a unique coach. The World Cup is something unique. Even the fact I'm here today for the launch of the trophy tour is amazing. It's something great for the fans. It gives them the opportunity to see what the beautiful trophy looks like up close. I was fortunate enough to win it, and it remains the most memorable moment of my sporting career. The trophy is something magical, really magical. Seeing it again always brings me huge pleasure. It's a feeling you can't describe. It's like a film playing in your head, showing all your memorable moments from the World Cup. Memories like the ones from USA 94, that goal celebration against the Netherlands, when I did that gesture and dedicated it to my son, Matthias. Alongside the activities on the pitch, the main attraction of the day was the FIFA World Cup trophy itself, which was presented on stage by both the FIFA and Russian presidents. My message today is uh, very clear and very simple. To the people of Russia, I tell them, enjoy and celebrate the trophy tour and then the World Cup. And to the people of the world, I tell them, Come to Russia, enjoy Russia, and celebrate the World Cup. For those in attendance, the event was a milestone, the latest on the road to 2018. On the pitch, the road to Russia continued as Belgium became the first European team to qualify. Knowing victory over opponents Greece and Piraeus would be enough to progress, the Red Devils opened the scoring through defender Jan Vertonghen. The hosts then equalised through their Portuguese-born midfielder, Zeca. Before Romelu Lukaku secured all three points and the Belgian spot in Russia next summer. With the second-place team progressing to the playoffs, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Greece and Cyprus still have all to play for with two games to go. In Asian qualifying, Japan secured their place at next year's FIFA World Cup as they defeated Australia in Saitama. Coming into the match as Group B leaders, the Blue Samurai were efficient in front of goal as Takuma Asano and Yosuke Idiguchi helped secure a 2-0 victory. The win ensures Japan's record of appearing at every final since 1998 remains intact. Five days later, Saudi Arabia joined Japan as they confirmed their qualification in Jeddah. Fahad Al Mawalad scoring the goal that took the Green Falcons back to the finals for the first time since 2006. It marked the last match in charge for Saudi coach Bert van Marvik, who's since been replaced by Argentine Edgardo Bowser. Despite defeating Thailand in the final group game, the Saudis' victory means Australia finished third in the standings and now progress to the AFC playoff. In Group A, Syria faced Iran at the Azadi Stadium in Tehran, looking to keep their World Cup hopes alive. 
Despite having to play all their home games in neutral venues outside their homeland, Syria have been the surprise package in Asian qualifying and opened the scoring through Tamer Haj Mohammed. The host soon struck back and took the lead thanks to a brace from forward Sadar Azmoun. Before Omar Al Suma secured the visitors a share of the spoils in injury time. The draw was enough for Syria to secure third place in the standings and the other AFC playoff spots, with Korea Republic claiming the second automatic qualifying position. In CONCACAF qualifying, Mexico booked their ticket to Russia next year as they defeated Panama at the Estadio Azteca in Mexico City. Herving Lozano with the game's only goal. With two games remaining, Mexico currently topped the standings ahead of Costa Rica, while Panama occupy the third automatic qualifying spot. In Comabol qualifying, Colombia looked to keep their recent run of good form going as they hosted already qualified Brazil in Barranquilla. Despite conceding shortly before half-time, the Colombians soon levelled the scores through Radamel Falcao, preserving their unbeaten run in qualifiers this year. Elsewhere, Ecuador faced Peru and Quito, looking to end their recent run of poor form, but it was the visitors who struck first, Edison Flores claiming his fifth goal in qualifying. The visitors then doubled their lead through Paolo Hurtado. And despite Ena Valencia pulling one back for Los Amarelos, the Peruvians held on for victory. The results is Peru move up into fourth and on course for their first finals appearance since 1982, Ecuador a seventh, while Colombia a third. And finally in the third round of Oceania qualifying, New Zealand travelled to Honiara to face the Solomon Islands in the second leg of the OFC final. Leading 6-1 from the first leg, the visitors' aggregate lead was rarely troubled as the two teams played out an eventful draw. The All-Whites will now face the fifth-place team in South American qualifying in the Intercontinental Playoff in November. The FIFA World Cup is the pinnacle of every footballer's career. On the road to Russia, we'll be profiling young stars hoping to shine on football's grandest stage. Here to tell us about his World Cup dream is a Russian youngster who plays for Zenit 2. I'm Nikolai Prudnikov. I play as a forward for Zenit 2 and the under-17 and 19 national teams. I began playing football when I was eight years old. I would play against boys two or three years older than me. When I was 14, I moved to Chertanovo, where I really developed and improved as a player. It's no secret that it's one of the best academies in Russia and possibly even Europe. From there I moved to Zenit, which wasn't a hard decision. It's an elite club and it's a great opportunity. My aim here is to further develop my skills and to one day play for the senior team. That's my main goal. My favourite player is Cristiano Ronaldo because I think he's a model footballer. He's an example of how hard work can pay off. I like his desire to continue improving, but I'm not sure what else he needs to work on. He's strong, he has pace and he can dribble. He can determine the outcome of a match on his own. In 2015, I had the opportunity to play at the Under-17 World Cup. It was an invaluable experience, which helps me during games now. It was perhaps where my football career moved to another level. However, I personally wasn't satisfied with my own and the team's performance. We wanted to at least make the semis, but we were eliminated by Ecuador in the round of 16. 
As a player, the tournament was an opportunity to showcase my abilities in front of the watching world. The natural progression is good players move on to stronger teams and championships. The first FIFA World Cup I fully immersed myself in watching was the 2010 tournament in South Africa. I tried to watch every game. I remember the players going onto the pitch and fighting for every ball. My dream is to play at a World Cup. It would have been great to play in a home tournament because the stadium would have been full of Russian fans. I understand that 2018 has probably come too soon for me, but I will definitely do my best to be a part of the national team in future World Cups. I know I still have a lot to work on, but my aim is to give 100% each day to improve myself. I know I can't relax if I want to fulfill my dreams. I had always wanted to be a professional player, but didn't expect it to come true. It was the realization of all my dreams. I had the honor of playing with 10 on my shirt, a number that some of the greatest players like Nikitin and Gazenko used to play in. To wear that number was really a great honor. When it comes to football in Volgograd, Valery Yesipov is a legend in these parts. Born in Shnigri, a small town approximately 800 kilometers northwest of Volgograd, the forward was a key member of the Rota team during the club's glory days in the 1990s. I began my career towards the end of the Soviet Union and the start of the Russian Championship. Back then, players didn't really move overseas to foreign clubs. If you took Spartak Moscow as an example, they had players like Karpin, Mostovoy, Ledyakov, Zimbala, Panatsky and Rakimov. The level of the championship was very high, and the dominant teams were Spartak, Alanya and, of course, Rota Volgograd. I think our success during this time was due to the dedication and passion of the club's president, coaches and players. The team was made up of guys who had never played in the Premier League. All they wanted to do as a squad, their main desire, was to play for the club and do well. For the next seven years, the team didn't change. It was the same group of players. We could anticipate each other's movements on the pitch. Probably our finest moment was in 1993. We finished runners-up in the league. It was the first silver medal in the history of the club. It was an unforgettable experience. We matched this in 1997, but that was bittersweet. We lost the title and our gold medals in the final match against Spartak Moscow. He may have fallen short in his pursuit of the league title, but the 45-year-old does hold the distinction of featuring on both top 10 lists for most appearances and goals in the Russian Premier League. To be honest, I've never really paid much attention to these records. I know my former teammate, Oleg Veretenikov, is the all-time leading scorer, followed closely by Alexander Kurzakov. It's a personal achievement to be a member of the 100 club. It means you've done something noteworthy. Since hanging up his boots in 2007, Yesipov has moved into coaching and is currently in his first season in charge of Rota. I never gave it much thought until I got closer to retirement. And the idea of becoming a coach appealed to me. I think if you coach a club you've played and achieved something with, then there's a certain degree of pressure. But as a coach, you have to be mindful not to talk about your own achievements. You shouldn't dwell on what your strengths and weaknesses were as a player. 
This is because football doesn't stop evolving. Players and their styles are constantly developing, both mentally and physically. Football in the 1990s had a certain pace. In the 2000s it was slightly different and now it's even higher. You shouldn't involve your ego. A team is a family and a coach should unite the players around him. Rota currently play in the second tier of Russian football, having enjoyed back-to-back -back promotions. While they've made an indifferent start to the season, the hope is that Valery Yesipov can lead the club back to the pinnacle of Russian football. That would certainly be the dream. This is because the atmosphere the Rota fans and the city creates for the team is worthy of the Premier League. I made my mark as a player. Now I'd like to do the same as a coach. What that'll be, I can't say for sure. At the moment, my aim is to help the team win every match. In late August, a selection of the international and domestic press was invited on a tour to view the progress on a number of the host city stadiums. The tour's first stop was the Yekaterinburg Stadium, the 2018 tournament's furthest east host venue. Due for completion in late 2017, the state-of-the-art arena will be home to the city's top football club, FC Ural. When it's finished, the stadium will have a capacity of 35,000. At the moment, it's approximately 80 to 85 percent done. You can see the pitch is being laid, the grass is being grown, and the seats are being installed. These are the final stages of construction. From there, the tour visited Rostov-on-Don and Volgograd, respectively, in the south of Russia, before travelling to three cities based within the Volga region, Samara, Saransk and Nizhny Novgorod. As is the case with the majority of the venues, each of the stadia in these three cities have their own unique design, which reflects the culture and industry of the region. In Samara, the stadium's look pays homage to the city's role in Russia's space program. There's no other stadium like it being constructed in Europe. There are no walls, like you would expect in other stadiums. The design of the Samara Arena means the roof goes all the way to the ground. It's supposed to resemble a flying saucer with 32 legs that's landed here in Samara. The tour also allowed the press to fully appreciate how the stadiums would function on match days and why they're being built in their chosen locations. The design and layout of the arena means fans will be able to enter and exit very quickly. It's being built at the convergence of the two rivers, near to a number of transport hubs, including the new metro station. The stadium's functionality and design fits in perfectly with its surroundings and allows fans access from both sides of the city. The tour then travelled on to Kaliningrad, the furthest west host city. Before concluding at Moscow's iconic Luzhniki Stadium. Due to host seven matches, including the final, the 81,000 capacity Luzhniki will host its first official match in November. Having lasted a total of 11 days and visited eight host cities, the tour gave all those who took part a first-hand look at how preparations are progressing as the 2018 tournament approaches. Dynamo means strength in movement. As a club, our philosophy consists of a number of patriotic leanings. Love for the motherland, love for Dynamo itself, and defending both. 
An example of this was during the Great Patriotic War. In 1942, when this city was under siege, the government at the time ordered that a football match be organized and played in our stadium. This was to show that we were still alive. Life in the city was very hard then. For 900 days, people were living on rations of 100 grams of bread a day. In order to hold such a match, required a huge effort from the players of Dinamo. They were starving, they were weak, and they hadn't played for a long time. But they came here and they played. It struck a huge psychological blow to the enemy and was perhaps even a turning point in the war. That game is probably the most important in Dinamo's history. Part of the famous Siege of Leningrad match that inspired the city's residents to defy the harsh conditions they faced, few clubs can claim to have as rich a history as Dinamo St. Petersburg. Founded in 1922, the team's popularity may have waned in recent years, but reminders of its past can be found around the grounds. Last season, the Blues won promotion to the National Football League, the second tier of Russian football, and the hope is the current squad can use the club's history to inspire them to further glory. Our aim is to continue the club's tradition of strength and spirit. We're a different generation, and perhaps remembering the events of 1942 doesn't resonate as much as it used to, but you can't hide what happened. We use it as motivation because people who come here know about the game and the players' strength of character. Dinamo was considered the oldest club in the city, and at a certain time, it was more popular than Zenit is today. For me, it's an honor to maintain its legacy. It's important to channel the team's history. If we can do this, I'm confident the club will have a great future. It's important to remember our history, because without knowing our past, we can't build a future. These days we have a slightly more modest goal than in 1942. We're an ambitious team and our dream is to win promotion to the Premier League, where we can play clubs like Zenit on an equal level.